Welcome everyone. I think uh, I'm, I will make a start. There's a few people waiting to join. Um, I think there's about 70 people uh, signed up to this, which is a fantastic number. Um, so thank you very much uh, for your interest. Um, I will mute you all, if that's all right with you. Um, I've got a colleague, Joe Begley, who's uh, running as an assistant for me today. So if you have any questions during the presentation, um, you can just put it in the chat function if you're familiar with Zoom, and then at the end of the expert, at the end of the the talk, uh, Joe will just host any questions that come through. Um, so I will mute all now. Um, the presentation has a couple of interactive quizzes, and it's useful to have a, a second device. So if you have a tablet or a, a mobile, it's it's handy to do it. Um, it's a bit of fun. Some may uh, have done Kahoot before. Um, it's a bit of fun, and it's just trying to break up the the, the kind of format of a of a presentation. Um, so, I will just begin, and I'll share a screen with you all now. Start the presentation. The presentation should take about 40 minutes, and that's giving the, uh, the quizzes as well. Um, so any, anything that pops up during the presentation, just uh, put it in the chat. Um, and hopefully you'll find this informative and uh, building on what knowledge you've already got, or be, you know, maybe some new information as well. So uh, in these virtual times where we're not allowed out really into the mountains, it's uh, it's a, an alternative approach really to, to learning about the natural world. It's not really my normal method. Uh, I run workshops in the UK and in the Alps as well. And uh, I do try and make them interactive. So I've virtually, I've tried this virtually today. Um, so what's it all about? To increase awareness of different habitats we find in the mountains. Uh, to develop knowledge of certain plant species. And to have fun with these online quizzes. So the different habitats we'll look at this, this evening are montane heaths and relic communities. Wild woods. Myers. Grasslands. Heath moorland and forest plantations. But just to get the ball rolling, I thought we'd start with something I do with, with clients, something that you uh, may uh, think is a really nice technique and a nice way of, of looking at a landscape and getting connections with that, the world around us and that mountain environment. Um, and it's, so I'm not sure why that is beeping. Um, it's the thinking routine. So what I'd like you to do is just look at that landscape and in your mind, because we can't, we have to do it virtually now, what do you see in that landscape? Just think for a moment. And if we were all together, some people may say, I see clouds, I see mountains, I see rocky ridges and I see clouds and blue sky and I see valleys. Then what do you think when you look at that landscape? What do you think? And you may think, well, I think it looks like it's very remote. There's very few people. You may think it's very beautiful. You may think that it's summer. Um, and then I get people to look at it from another perspective. And, and what do you wonder about that landscape that you look at? And you may wonder, how far are we going to walk today? You may wonder what it's like to climb some of those, uh, what the view would be like from one of those rocky summits. You may wonder, if you're going to get your feet wet walking across that that lowish kind of straw colored area so 
just a way of looking at the natural world, but making a connection. And I, I think it puts you in a picture um, for the environment that we're working in or we're just walking in. So that's a visible thinking routine. I use that quite a lot when I'm out with groups, just to, to form that, um, to get the ball rolling with them. And it's like the awe and wonder. But getting onto the theme now, we're looking at the mountain environment and we know it as our uplands. And broadly speaking, uh, this is, you know, encompasses the mountain and the moorlands that we, we often walk in. And it's the area above the limit for enclosed agriculture. So it's unbounded area, um, generally accepted being about above 600 meters in altitude. The climate's pretty cool. So there's a relief map of the UK and you can see with Wales and central North England, Lake District and up into Scotland, that's the higher, the higher ground. And our uplands have a cold climate. So you can see there minimum average temperatures in the winter, dark blue in Cairngorms is minus four average temperature. Um, the red is above, above freezing. So you can look at, at that mountain environment as being a cold environment. And also when you look at the relief rainfall map, then you can see that it's also where the wet area. So it's the cold, it's humid, uh, lots of cloud cover and long periods of, of snow cover and, and lots of frost. And also because of that environment it's so extreme, the growing season is quite small. But it wasn't always that warm. <laughs> um, our landscape is a stark reminder of our long and cold past. So in Scotland, we got beautiful U-shaped valleys like that in Wales and the Lake District. So these upland areas have, have been carved out by uh, the action of ice in our, what we know as our glacial history. So we've got these ridges with beautiful landscapes. Um, but the earth has had permanent ice in one or both poles. So in Antarctica, there's an ice cap which has been there for two million years and it's known as a Quaternary Ice Age. And in this period, this cold period, there's, it's one of five episodes in the world's existence where we've had ice on the pole. So the last two million years, you have permanent ice. It's only five times in the Earth's history we've had that. And they're known as Ice House Earth. We've also had periods of time where Antarctica has had tropical rainforests. Um, 50 million years ago, so at the end of the dinosaur era, the climate was far, far warmer than it is today. And there were tropical forests in Antarctica. Um, so this, the, the, the idea of climate change and the patterns of, of climate um, over long periods of time. We've had greenhouse earth, but we're now currently in what's called an ice house earth, where we get these glaciations. And the uplands of Britain have experienced advances and retreats of, of, of ice. Uh, at the moment we're in a relatively warm period be between glaciations, but the last great extent of ice that came over northern Europe from Scandinavia came across on this map you can just see with a pointer you can see where we are north that's the line so below that line there was never permanent ice so you've got periglacial conditions there or tundra and then the north of Britain was covered by an ice cap that went across to Scandinavia that was 20,000 years ago and that ice has retreated back and away and um, 10,000 years ago we had no permanent ice in Britain so we we're between glaciations if that makes sense so that's a bit of the background to um, our uh, kind of upland environment when we look at these high mountain tops we've got different habitats that we will we'll walk across and you might not notice some of the little dwarf woody plants that we get um, in these upland areas, these heaths. So these, a little plant there is um, a plant called least willow, some people call it dwarf willow. And what you see is the smallest tree in Britain, one of the smallest trees in the world, it's a real bonsai. Um, all you see above the surface 
is the leaf. So all the twigs and the branches and the roots, obviously, they're all below ground. So all we get to see of this tiny little tree are the leaves above ground. So it's really um, incredibly low lying, so it protects from the wind and from the, the harsh environment. But um, an area of, say, uh, a metre, two metre squared area may be one plant. So they're, to grow that long takes a very long time. So these little plants are very long lived. In Scotland, you get a, a, a plant there with its waxy leaves known as trailing azalea. People call it creeping azalea. Um, you don't get it south of Scotland, but you do get it there. So these dwarf shrubs, these woody shrubs are very long lived and trailing azalea will live to be about 120 years old. I think dwarf willow, something in that range as well. So there, you don't get many young uh, or short lived plants in the mountains. The environment's too extreme for them. It's also home to spore-bearing plants we know as cryptogams. So these are the, the mosses and the ferns and the, and the lichens. So these are real hardy specialists of the high mountain environment. Um, they can live off hardly any soil. And those lichens um, do actually just penetrate into the rock and eventually they'll, they'll kind of disintegrate bits of the mineral from the rock and as they die they form this very primitive kind of thin soil and the essence for the soils that we have in these much warmer lowland areas have all started from the action of, of uh, the lichens which have just started to create this this organic soil for other plants to survive in. And up in these high mountain areas we also get these relic communities the arctic alpine communities. Um, we group them as such because they've either got an arctic origin or they have an alpine origin but they're at the extent or right at the very far reaches of their natural environment so they're they're not as comfortable here as they were once at the end of the ice age but they're still this relic um, and they're it's a shame we're not allowed into the mountains at the moment but they're just starting to come into their prime and um, beautiful kind of uh, arrays of color and, and flowers and, and such they are again superbly adapted to these cold environments, they're extreme environments, not very good competitors. So in a moorland or a grassland environment, they would be outcompeted. So they're true specialists to these long, cold uh, periods, a lot of snow cover um, and, and such. Plants like moss campion, they're cushion plants, and again, it's woody, uh, long-lived, and that moss campion um, I've seen uh, individuals which are in the Alps and um, there's one that I've been recorded being about a meter and a half across and it's estimated to be 300 years old so they grow at a very very slow rate um, but they're very long lived and these cushion flowers you find them in the high base rich rocks in the mountains in Britain even in far north of Scotland you see it on living growing on the coast so it's the environment is so extreme there that it can survive at those low levels. Species that you may come across, um, that one, if you know what that is, the name is coming up now, purple saxifrage. It's a map forming plant, it does have woody stems again, woodiness uh, is longevity, so it's a, a long lived plant. Um, it does have on its leaves a little encrustation of of lime it's got this white uh uh crusty tip and that's a sign that it's on a lime rich or calcium rich environment so these are base rich and base loving plants and you generally find them on um base rich environments rather than acidic environments the highest known flowering plant in the alps and it's also the furthest northerly flowering plant in the world in northern greenland so it's got a phenomenal range and there's a, a kind of polar view of the Northern Hemisphere. So you've got Britain down here. My point has disappeared. Um, um, there's Britain, but you find it across in the Alps, across Scandinavia, into Mongolia, and down into um, Canada and Greenland. So it's got this circumpolar uh, distribution. Another plant which is 
found in the UK, but also has a polar, circumpolar distribution is the Snowden lily. Um, in Britain, it's only found in six places in, in Snowdonia, but I've seen it in the Alps, um, I've seen it in Mongolia, uh, it's found in the Rockies in Canada, in Canada and North America. So it's got one of these amazing distributions, but in Britain, it's, it's very uh, specialist. Um, and it's the only alpine flower which is found, um, the only alpine flower in Britain that's found in Wales that's not found in Scotland. So basically everything that we have in Britain in terms of these Arctic alpine plants are found in Scotland, but this is the only exception. So as the climate warmed up, trees started to kind of appear. And uh, seven or 8,000 years ago, Caledonian pine forest, this was common across the whole of the UK. But as the climate at the end of the ice age was starting to warm up and these plants started with just being outcompeted and pushed further and higher into the mountains with the advancement of trees, um, Caledonian pine forest appeared. It's now uh, in the highlands in Scotland. And as that climate warmed up, that, that coniferous forest, um, which is a, a colder environment um, habitat, uh, was outcompeted by the faster growing deciduous or broadleaf forest. So you get these remnants today, and they are tiny fragments of these wild woods. So the Caledonian pine forest, you can see the extent there of the extent of the original forest from some 7,000 years ago. And then these black sections just show where it's found today. So it's, its range has been phenomenally reduced. And that natural environment has been replaced by other habitats, which we'll come to. So let's have a look at who I am. If you can identify that uh, tree from the leaf. And um, we've got another leaf there. Now, are they the same or are they not the same? Now, they look identical. A um, couple of things that are different, and this is where kind of observational skills come in. This leaf has a long stalk, whereas that one doesn't have a stalk. And then this one, the leaf bends down from um, as it comes off that stalk, whereas this one, just comes up like that. So they are different species um, of the same uh, type of tree. One has an, an acorn which is born without a stalk and the other one has an acorn which is born on a stalk. So one's got a stalk on the leaf but not on the acorn and the opposite. One is sessile oak so sessile means without stalk in the sense of the, uh, the, the acorn. And then the English oak or the common oak is the one with the stalk. So they're very similar. The sessile oak preferring the colder, wetter, uh, mountainy environment of the west of Britain. We just move on to look at Myers before we go into one of these interactive quizzes. If a Meyer is acidic and the soil is acidic, then we know it as a bog. If it's rich in bases and calcium and, and potassium and magnesium and so on, then we know it as a fen. So to do with the pH of it, if it's acidic, it's a bog, if it's alkaline, it's a fen. But they're made of peat. So these bogs are, are on a peat soil, which to form peat, it's gotta be one of three things. It's gotta be cold, it's gotta be acidic, so the bacteria and fungi don't function or there's got to be an absence of oxygen and essentially decomposition of that organic soil is has been reduced so it builds up this accumulated dark rich peat two to three centimeters in a hundred years so a meter thick peat would be anywhere about five thousand years old so it's incredibly slow forming and it forms from one plant which is sphagnum although there's 37 different species of sphagnum in britain it's the it's the the, the peat forming plant uh, that's really really dominant. And what we see is just the the living 
they're like little sponges and they can absorb like 20, 20 times their own weight in, in, in water. So they're incredible at holding water and keeping waterlogged conditions. And it's just the top bit that we see. So the long plant itself, it doesn't have any roots, it's a moss, um, gets all its nutrition from rainwater. So it lives just, it bulges just up and out of the, the, uh, the mire and it's just that top bit that's living. Um, in the west of Britain, we have blanket bogs. They're extensive. Uh, you've got to have high rainfall and you've got to have maybe 160 days a year you need and you have that cold climate, that humid climate. So blanket bogs we get in our mountain environment. Whereas in the east of Britain, where you might have a waterlogged valley, um, you may get a raised bog, but if it's rich and alkali, then it's a fen. So what we find in our mountains when we get wet feet are blanket bogs rather than raised bogs. So a couple of species that we find in these wet areas. Uh, one of three or four different heaths that are really common, cross-leaved heath. It's a wet loving plant. Um, it's got uh, its branches come off in fours around the stem and hence the name tetra so it's tetralix or cross leaved um, in wet areas flowers july and august and Giles darwin thought that the leaves um it had these little glands and he thought it was a, a a carnivorous plant but that's what his research was way way back but it's not been shown to be a carnivorous plant another plant common in myers will flower in july bog aspidil and a little fact about it, it was uh, its name, Ossifragum, comes from ossia or bones and fraga, which means fragile. So it was thought that it gave cows and cattle brittle bones, but the environment that it lives in, um, all that organic matter stored in the peat and it's very poor in nutrients, so acidic. So these plants are specialists in those environments. And uh, another of our insectivorous plants there's three insectivorous types of plant that we have in Britain this is one in Welsh it's got a beautiful name Tavodagoras which is the the tongue of the bog and you can see it's green leaves there that curl up and they digest they exude enzymes and they digest insects so they're a carnivorous plant fantastic site in 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 bogs and, and wet flushes and so we're going to move so on the theme of woodlands um, so we've got our wild woods, but ancient woodlands, uh, we still have remnants of these in the country. Um, but when we talk about an ancient woodland, we, we're talking about a, a site which has had continuous forest cover for at least 400 years. So the old tithing maps from 1600s were really detailed and, and good accuracy of, of what the land use was at that time. And so forest would have been around for a couple hundred years before that. So we know these as, as ancient woodlands. And within these ancient woodlands, you have indicators. And so we may know bluebells and wood anemones and wood sorrel and such. So wherever you see those species, there would once, there must have once been a, a woodland, a, a, a woodland environment. So we know uh, where the elevation of these environments got to, but there's also other organisms which are bioindicators of ancient woodlands so you can only survive so we have lichens on the trees different types of coralline lichen um, and also mosses as well so it's not just bluebells and, and such which are the indicators but there's many there's hundreds of um, something like a thousand or so uh, just over a thousand moss species in the whole of Britain um, so incredibly diverse but there a lot of them are you know require this this damp or humid environment but these woodlands have been managed for a long time and the woods are valuable commodity for timber wood products and for thousands of years it's it, they've been uh utilized Med, in medieval time the art of woodsmanship really came to its fore and um we've got practices that 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 go on in our woodlands we've got 
things that we're maybe familiar with coppicing so there's a hazel coppice um so a great product for um poles you might coppice every five to ten years and depends what you're you're after from your wood product um if you wanted a charcoal then you may have a, a slightly slower uh, rate of, of coppice so maybe 15 to 30 years but if you want poles and things then you'd have it on a more regular rotation those coppices can live up to over each one of those plants or those trees could live up to a thousand years so by keeping the rootstock and by keeping the the branches uh young the roots can live for a very long time so it's it's an incredible when you think a, an oak tree can live to maybe five or six hundred years as a tree a coppice could live for over a thousand years so it's really useful management um, and sustainable practice we've also got woodland pastures so woodlands have been used again you couldn't have the two side by side because the grazing animals would eat all the young shoots so you get this sward of 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 grass and mature trees um, in the kind of woodland pastures and again they're fairly common if you're walking around um, in the uplands but something you don't see as much of, you find these in the States, is pollarding. And it's a, it's a technique where the tree is like coppicing, but it's done at a height above the, the, um, the chewing mouths of the grazers. So anywhere from six or eight foot, maybe a bit higher. And they produce this wealth of, of new shoots. Young trees and young plants are, are much more vigorous in their, what they can offer in terms of food. Um, so this would be used as a, as a winter fodder for the, for the animals which are grazing in the summer. So pollarding is an old technique and again it's a woodland technique, um, not as common as, as coppicing but the principle is the same. Species that we may, uh, absolutely fantastic at the moment, they're out in, in full force and um, they've got beautiful six petaled starry flower in clusters about 25 the ramsons or wild garlic um, the botanical name asylum comes from latin because it was uh, meaning bear it was a favored food of the brown european brown bear um, and if you've never made if you've never been out into a wet woodland and got some leaves and chopped it up and added um, almonds and a bit of oil and a bit of parmesan it makes a beautiful pesto but that's another thing but if you've never tried that it's worth trying so bluebells we mentioned um, there are two bluebells that we'll we'll see commonly uh, one is not native and one is native so which one is native and the things that are diff that differentiate them the scent so the Spanish bluebell uh, is scentless and the native bluebell is beautiful scent. So if you go out in a woodland, have a smell. The colour, you can see these uh, are a pale violet with a dark blue stripe, whereas the, the native bluebell is uh, a much deeper colour. And the shape, so our bluebell has a the sides which are long and tubular and it's like they're parallel sides and then they curl out at the tip whereas on the Spanish bluebell they they're like a flute they, they just they flare out um, without that abrupt curl at the end and then the leaves the, the native bluebell has got a much thinner softer leaf as well so something to, to think about when you're out and when you see a bluebell have a smell see which one it is have a closer look of the two uh, of the um, the next habitat that you find in our mountain environment we find grasslands and these are huge vast expanses now but they never were ex ex expansive as they were they were maybe glades in woodlands um, but from the neolithic era and bronze age huge clearance of our of our old forests and there's evidence of this in in core peat samples so the pollen records changed dramatically about five thousand years ago huge clearances um, the uh, kind of slash and burn technique, but the the animals and the, the agriculture that they that they started, um, they would leave once they've harvested their their um, their grains, they would leave the land fallow, and that would get covered by grasses, and the animals would come and feed off that in those fallow times. So the grass species start to really develop, and then into the Iron Age, 
a huge increase and the advent of the hay meadow. So these hay meadows exist where the land hasn't been fertilized. It's just a natural meadow, low nutrient meadow, species rich, and then they were harvested. So we've had that um, since the Iron Age. Um, and the, the Doomsday Book shows evidence a thousand years ago of, of meadows and pastures as a traditional upland farming method. But today we have these very what we call rough grazing it's the agricultural limit of 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 farming land really it's very very poor thin soils and uh the nutrition that you get from them doesn't support great headage whereas in the lowlands where you can fertilize the land you can add nutrients and uh, you can seed with different species you can get a much greater fertility and as well adding the fertilizers has led to silage as opposed to hay which is unfertilized and so we've got much more silage production now, which is far richer and, and more nutritious, I suppose, more concentrated. So we've had a huge change in grasslands, but there's still a managed environment in our uplands. Heather Moorlands, uh, it's basically found above 300 meters, these areas, these expansive kind of um, fieldless, open wild this got a fantastic feel of, of openness um, from about 300 meters generally dominated by heathers but you can get it, it all depends on how the land has been managed and what they're managing it for um, but it's a treeless environment but it was once a, a, a forested environment um, but again we go back to those the neolithic the surly settlers clearing these vast expanses of land grazing animals we've got sheep we've got cows and they eat in a very different way so the cows use their tongues and they rip it up rip up the, the, the vegetation they leave a much deeper uh, sward whereas the sheep are close grazers so they they leave a much finer close cropped environment so they the way the land is managed it, you can see that in the in represented in the, the vegetation a technique which is really important in moorlands is burning and fires naturally occur every two or three hundred years you'll get natural fires that will burn the heathers um, but it's a great way of controlling the age of heather and when heathers get old they don't produce as much nutritious food uh, they also get taller and they're not grazed by the animals because it gets out of their their height so by burning it, it keeps them young and it also adds the nutrients back into the soil so it does add um, potassium and, and various other minerals into the soil so it does increase that. Careful not to do it when the land's too dry or when there's not enough wind because if the fire doesn't keep moving then it will burn into the roots and you don't really want to kill the plant because it'll take years for it to redevelop so you just want to just burn off the, the woody growth and then you stimulate the, um, the young shoots. Now you can see a little rowan tree and so that's been about maybe two years or so since that area had been burnt, but it's regenerated. When land is managed for grouse, it's managed in a very different way. So when you burn for cows or, or sheep grazing, it's haphazard. But when you're burning for grouse moorland, it's a very structured and organized method. And um, Heather grows about 40 years old, 30 to 40 years old, goes big, tall and woody. And that mature phase is, is useful as a cover for, for the grouse and for protection, but it's not very good for the food as we, I've just mentioned. So uh, there's a rotation about, about eight to 10% of an area is, is managed on a, a, a rotation, maybe every five to 10 years, but an area of 10% of that area will be rotated on a regular pattern to maintain this very low, um, sward and then a bit more mature and then some you know much more mature taller vegetation but it's it's done very very carefully for um, grouse um, and so it, it's uh, another way of, of managing for um, you know our, our uplands there. Species that we find commonly uh, in our moorland ling is the most common heath plant, 75% of, of the areas or the 75% of 
the coverage in the country is, is ling in the, in the heather moorland so it's dominant it likes damp conditions it likes dry conditions whereas the crossleaf heath only likes the wet areas and bell heather for instance only likes dry areas so um yeah it's it's found everywhere it's it's robust its botanical name Kaluna uh, comes from Greek meaning to beautify or to sweep clean. So it may have come from the fact that it was used to, to sweep um, in, the, in, you know, in, in old brooms and brushes. So that's maybe the origin of its, of its name there. Another plant that's been in flower for a couple of weeks, if you've been fortunate to get up into the moors, um, is milkwort. Uh, there's two species, so super, Sim they're so closely related that um, one likes dry areas, one likes wetter areas, but you can't really tell them apart. It's, it's uh, something, it's the leaf orientation. It's, it's, uh, but one thing you notice about milkwort is they come from a beautiful dark blue color through to violet, to pink and to white. So it's the same species, but they have a huge color variation. The name polygala comes from the Greek meaning much milk and it was, it's, thought it's got a reputation for increasing milk flow in cows, cattle. So the last environment that we're going to look at in the uh, uplands is forestry. So it's an, it's an afforestation. Um, plantations were established on these former deforested areas, so our old moorland or grasslands, and they began um, in private estates in the 18th century. And they were European species like um, silver fir and Norway spruce, European larch, they were species that were planted back, way back then. And then during the 19th century, botanists had gone around the world and they found new species and they brought in other, other species. So things like the Douglas fir and the J and Japanese larch and Sitka spruce, which often dominate our kind of plantations today. They grow really well in, in, in our kind of mountain upland environment. But the, the major impetus for large scale afforestation came in 1919 with the establishment of the Forestry Commission. And there'd been a massive reduction in the coverage of, of woodlands in Britain, down to about 5% through the demands of the, the First World War. So the Forestry Commission was there to, to recreate forest environment as a resource. Um, there is some negative aspects of forestry. You can see in the previous photo with the, the land clearances, the clear felling, um, but they do have great amenity value, mountain biking, walking and such. So the, 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 in terms of conservation, there are some losers like ground nesting birds, which were in the moorlands like the golden plover, um, hen harriers, uh, green shank, but then in this new environment that we've got, this forestry land, we've got more crossbills and we've got more siskins. So um, there are, and naturally when you change the environment, you get different species. So it's not all a negative um, effect on our, on our upland, um, but we, we won't dwell on that much now. But we, what I'd like to do is have a look at three of the common conifer groups. So we have, the first one is a uh, fir tree and the fir trees have not always but they have parallel sides to each of the needles and this you can see the white two parallel white lines and then the little it its foot that joins onto the twig is is just like it's just been stuck on so that is silver fir the needles are soft you have these two white lines on the underside it's beautiful citrus smell and the the cones it's so hard to get pictures of these cones um because they're only found at the top of of um, fir trees there's very few fir trees that have female cones low down they're only at the top but you'll you'll see on the spruce tree so this one is a norway spruce um you have white dots as opposed to lines they're generally spiky and much stiffer and then you can't really see here, but the, the color of the needle goes brown and then that peg carries on along the branch there. So you find these different structure on there. Much Sitka spruce especially, really sharp. Um, Norway spruce is a bit softer, but has a sharp point. You have white dots, 
Um, and then you get these long drooping hanging uh, uh, cones, which are all over the plant. So spruces, cones all over the tree, firs only at the, only at the very top. And these tall trees go 60 meters, 50 to 60 meters tall. So it's very hard to see those. And they don't fall off. They fall apart before they fall off. Um, and then Scots pine, you have here, you have pairs of needles. So often people say pines in pairs, spruces are single um, as a, a kind of way of remembering. But you've got these woody cones that, that hang down. They're not very big on Scots pine, but the needles twist and they're in pairs. Some pines are not in pairs, but it's a really good rule of thumb. So I want to do. I hope you found that interesting, um, and I hope you found the whole presentation interesting. There's ways that I would like to stay in touch with you. I mean, it's the first presentation that I've, I've done for myself. I, I've done them in the past for mountain training and uh, for Baymol and the like, but. I thought I'll see how it goes if people are interested, a, a general audience. So um, I'm thinking of doing uh, another webinar on medicinal plants and their uses. I'm also thinking about doing one on alpine flowers um, and their ecology. And uh, I also run workshops when we're allowed to get back into the mountains. I do run workshops. That's my normal method of communicating um, on a variety of topics. Um, there's a w various ways of keeping in touch through social media. I have a website, Nature's Work. Um, I've also been developing a few ways that you could take learning with you into the, into the environment, either on your own with groups or with your family. So um, a factory has been I've shut down for the last few weeks. I've been waiting for um, some of my cards to be redeveloped or reprinted. Uh, I believe they're going to be coming in the next couple of days. But I've got cards, flower cards. Um, that's my general theme, really. Trump cards and playing cards with facts, a bit like the facts of the flowers that we, we highlight some species in the talk. I've also written a book on, on the Alps as well, um, on, with, a, with a colleague who wrote about geology, I wrote about the flowers. Um, so there's a bit of a theme with my, uh, with, my, with my talks. Just as a very final thing, if you would again use your phone, um, type in www.menti.com or you could use the QR code in the screen. And once you're on, if you type in the code, which is 863355, then um, we'll get some instant feedback from you. Um, and I will just... No, Google desktop two. Sorry, I'm just. I think there's some. Does that come in? So, is can you all see that um, word cloud? Joe, can you see the word cloud? Jim, could we have the code again, please? Yes, it's at the top of that screen. So it's eight six three three five five. What I'll do when all this has been populated, then I, I'll put it on. Um, I'll put it on my Facebook page, Nature's Work Facebook page. Excellent, useful, informative, great quiz. I tried to make it as in, engaging as I could, but it's, it's difficult um, to do that. But, and then the second question was how enjoyable, quality of presentation, did it meet your expectations? Did you enjoy the quizzes? And then the next one, I'm just putting a feeler out on the third slide, just to see if people would or wouldn't pay for a future webinar. I quite enjoy doing them and, you know, I just seeing what the, the, the 
the, the, the market is like for that. So um, just so that I can gauge it, you know, I'm happy to do a few of these, put the time in to share my interest and my love for the mountains with people. Um, so that's fantastic. And if anyone wants any of the, the absolute feedback or whatever, um, then you can email me um, or, you know, you can call me or whatever. And, and, uh, but that's 31 to seven. So I really appreciate all of your, your feedback there. I know it's almost seven o'clock. Um, Joe, were there many questions or any questions or anything that stands out that You're muted, Joe, so I'll just unmute yeah. you. Yeah, there's a request for a presentation uh, for foraging. Okay, so that would go into, in the realms of the, the medicinal plants and their uses. Yeah, and um, I think there were a couple of requests that is this presentation going to be available somewhere? I'm, I've recorded it, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll trim it a little bit. I cut out the quizzes and I'll put it onto YouTube. I've got a little channel on YouTube, which I'm developing slowly. Um, and then I'll put a link onto my Facebook page. And if you want an 